to the Wednesday, May 20th, 2020 edition of the Clemson Dubcast. Hope everybody out there is having a great week so far. A great couple of weeks for Clemson football. First, Will Shipley in the bag. Then yesterday, Barrett Carter, one of the big fish from Georgia and coveted by the flagship school in Georgia in Athens. Great job by Paul Strilo and also Chad Simmons of the Rivals Network, keeping everybody plugged into that. Plenty of analysis from that decision. Also a column for me that was released earlier today about if if Alabama has been the chief on-field obstacle over the last few years for Georgia that they've struggled to get past. Is Clemson the new off-the-field, as in recruiting trail obstacle that is going to be hard for Georgia to get past, although probably not accurate to say new obstacle because there are a few guys go by the name of Trevor Lawrence, Deshaun Watson, who in the years past have spurned the home state Bulldogs to go to Clemson across the border and win national championships. So check out all that coverage and more at tigerillustrated.com. Title sponsor of the podcast since the very day we began, Parm Smith and Argentine Law Firm in downtown Greenville. I've known Blake Smith for a long time, I guess about 10 or 12 years ago. He helped me with the situation involving some possible medical malpractice, gave me some great advice, and it wasn't just preferential treatment. That's how he and his staff, which includes Brooke Archenhold, handle every case. They are founded on a dedication to helping injured individuals throughout South Carolina. Free consultations. Phone number 864-990-4581 or online at parhamlaw.com, P-A-R-H-A-M law.com. Another loyal supporter of the Dubcast is Blackacre Law Firm in Greenville, a subsidiary of Parham, Smith & Archenthold. Blackacre helps South Carolina residents achieve their dreams of home ownership by providing experienced professional representation for real estate closings. Attention to detail is crucial in real estate law. Blackacre is committed to making sure nothing gets by them preparing residential or commercial closings. Black Blackacre also offers estate planning services for their clients in the Greenville area. Find out more about Blackacre at 864-326-3507. Okay, to our conversation with Eric George, who spent four and a half years at Clemson as the chief financial officer for the Tigers Athletic Department and who recently moved to Mississippi State to work in their athletic department and actually closing on his house in Clemson today. So really interesting conversation here with Eric from his new digs in Starkville. All right, here we go. Enjoy. Okay, joined by Eric George, the new Executive Senior Associate Athletics Director and CFO for Mississippi State. Congratulations on the move, Eric. Hey, thanks, Larry. I appreciate you having me on. All right, your life, wow, has been a whirlwind. When I heard you were leaving Clemson, for for Starkville, I'm like, how is he pulling this off uh, in the middle of a pandemic? <laughs> and, and I don't mean to lie, I don't mean to make light of, of that, but it, but it's it's definitely a, a question. The first question I'm, I'm sure most people have. Yeah, well, you know, I, I'll, I'll start by saying um, I wasn't wasn't looking to leave. Clemson's an incredible place. There's some um, some unbelievable people there, and and you know they, they say there, there's something special in those hills, and and it's true. Um, and, and Dan and Graham and, and the rest of the, the staff there were some of the best people I've ever worked with. Um, so it wasn't, wasn't looking to leave, but, um, as, as, you know, part of, part of being surrounded by great people is they, they push you and elevate you. And so, um, I got an opportunity here. They, they called and, and asked if I was interested in the position. Um, Jerry Benko, who, who was in this role, uh, just became the AD at Georgia Southern, and so it so it opened up and and this all kind of went down right as the uh, right during the, the um, conference basketball tournaments. So I, I got a call from John Cohen, the AD here, uh, the Wednesday of of um, the tournaments, and, and later that night, you know, everything started started being canceled, and and you know the the ball started rolling downhill pretty quickly. But um, I, I came out and. and took a visit here. It was great. It actually reminds me a lot of Clemson. Um, just the, the small college town, you know, Southern roots and, um, just very friendly, hospitable people. And so, um, we all, you know, brought the family down. Everyone, everyone really enjoyed the visit. And, um, so we wound up pulling the trigger and, um, 
you know, it was, it's a, it's a crazy time to be starting a, a new job in general, but especially in, in the financial world with everything that's going on. And, um, you know, I can, I can speak fairly intelligently about the finances at Clemson, just haven't been there for five years, but, uh, it, it it's going to take a little bit more research for me to know what I'm talking about here. So it's, it's been a, a certainly a, an interesting transition and, and the working from home has, has made things easier in some ways and harder in others. And, uh, we've been in the office here for the last uh, month or so at Mississippi State, so it, that that has been helpful. But uh, certainly a unique time, um, you know, tough situation for a lot of people, and and feel very fortunate to to even you know be in this position to have a job right now. But um, it's certainly been a a wild ride, and um, you know even even pulling some double duty trying to to get things in a good spot there while while getting started here. Um, during all the the pandemic has, has been crazy. So is it safe? Is it accurate to say basically you were third in command at Clemson behind D. Rad and Graham, and now you're second in command there? Is that? Yeah, more or less. Um, at Clemson, there there were there were a handful of us that were kind of on that that level, but um, yeah, n- now number two um, here at Mississippi State. And did you how did, how did how, how did things like this, or how did 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 this work? Did you have a prior? relationship with the ad there john cohen um i did not with john but but jared the the person i replaced um him and graham and i know each other real well have been, been friends for um for, for quite a while and uh, a lot of the things that jared was was trying to implement and doing here at mississippi state was stuff that we were doing at clemson so we talked quite a bit um you know with concessions and, and fan friendly pricing and some of the travel um, agent side, we, you know, th- there were a lot of similarities in, in the two schools and, and how we operate, um, and and just really in general that kind of do more with with less mentality. So um, I've known Jared for a while, and, and he um, put in a good word for me with with John the AD, and, and then when when John and I talked, um, hit it off from the start. And John's a great guy, former baseball coach, had a lot of success um, on the baseball side, uh, and then and then has moved over to the the AD role here for about uh, three years or so. Um, and, and so it would be a great opportunity for me to learn, you know, Dan and, and Graham and um, everyone on the, on the Clemson side was a very heavy business and finance. John being from the coaching side, will, um, you know, it'll be a different relationship b- between us than, than Dan and Graham and I had, but um, certainly excited about it. And you mentioned the, the, the week of the, of the conference tournaments, I think, that week and then the week after will f- be forever seared into everyone's memory. Can you mm-hmm. just think back just the timeline of events that week because things happened so quickly, but just from your chair, I'm, I'm assuming you were back in Clemson. I know that I guess Graham Neff was, was with the basketball team mm-hmm. at the ACC tournament. Can So you just recount, um, how things unfolded just from, from your chair and your office that week as, as things just progressed yeah. in such a rapid fashion? Yeah, no, that was certainly a crazy week. And, and like you said, something we'll, we'll never forget. Um, kind of going into that week, we had been looking at different things. You know, there had been some talk about um, baseball and softball and some of the spring sports possibly moving to, um, you know, maybe in some way having a, a reduced – um, capacity or you know, it was a possibility of, of not pl- playing in, without fans. And so we had run some models and looking at what that meant from a, a ticket revenue and concessions revenue standpoint, but then also the savings that you would have by not paying event staff and really kind of looking at baseball on that. Um, and I remember talking, I was talking to uh, Ben Terrio, who's the, the CFO for the ACC conference office. And we were talking Wednesday night about you know what would happen from a, an insurance coverage standpoint and how, how much coverage could they have and um, what would that mean for ticket sales and refunds and should we refund should the conference refund the entire tournament should they just refund the games that hadn't been played yet you know what how do we do that and right as we were sitting there talking um, I saw the alert come up on TV about uh, Rudy Gobert testing positive in the NBA. And that that completely changed things. We, that was kind of the the point where we were like, this is this is no longer, um, you know, what if this is this is happening. And so from that point on, um, it became 
let's let's try to figure out what what this is going to mean financially to us and what is this going to mean um trying to get kids home we had track um track was 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 out in new mexico for the ncaa tournament obviously as you mentioned basketball was um up in in greensboro and so the first concern was was kind of getting everybody home and, and making sure they were all safe but but then the the second part of that was you know what does this mean um financially and what does this mean for the rest of the semester with um academic classes and and um just making sure that everyone was on the same page and that we were moving in lockstep with the university and uh, and that's probably one of the biggest the, the biggest takeaways is that you know in, in a lot of ways athletics is kind of its own self-contained bubble and um you know different from the rest of the university and how we do things but there's been such close at Mississippi State and at Clemson such close coordination with the university on everything that that we've done um, to, to deal with this situation. So um, it's it's kind of been you know, obviously not not a great situation in, by any means, but it's kind of been cool to see how how groups across campus who normally don't interact have, have come together, and making sure that everyone's you know pulling in the same direction. I want to make sure I'm getting the timeline right. Um, you know they canceled the basketball tournaments and then the NCAA I guess abruptly announced that all spring sports were canceled so is that was it a case of you guys not even being able to inform your coaches and players of the news they had they were seeing it themselves and then how did that yeah what, how did that unfold yeah and, um, we 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 had calls with the the conference office and with the NCA. Dan was on some with with the NCA. Um, me, Graham, Stephanie Ellison, Johnson, our, our SWA. Like everyone was was on calls and talking to different groups, and then trying to relay that out to the teams as as quick as we could. But um, in some ways, we were learning it at the same time they were, you know, on on social media and um, through other channels. And so that was yeah, that was really tough, especially when when you've got a team. Um, you know, you've got kids that are far the way into the season and, and, you know, baseball was, was incredibly successful. Softball was having, you know, the, the season of a lifetime, first season ever, and, and just the success they were having. Um, and so, so for those kids to find out that that, that was kind of it and for it to hit so abruptly without any warning, without the coaches being able to, to really soften the blow, um, that was incredibly difficult. That, that was, um, I'd say probably next to, to, cutting a sport one of the toughest things that, that you can experience as a coach or an administrator is is watching the, the those teams realize that, that everything they had been working for was was done all of a sudden um so there, that was really tough but there there was a little uncertainty on um some kind of what was going to happen and where we're going to resume and you know the ncaa said there were no no more championships but there was, um, you know, the kind of that question of, well, just because there's no championship, could we still play? Could we um, have still an ACC season and, and go into the ACC championship and then end with that? And I think deep down, a lot of people knew that that wasn't going to happen, but there was still that that um, you know, the, the hope of maybe this isn't completely done. Um, and so over the next few days, I, it's all kind of runs together, but next few days, a week or so was, was when we kind of worked through, what does this truly mean? Um, from a timeline, are they, are we completely done? You know, there's obviously the recruiting aspect to it that, that completely changed and, and still to this point has not opened back up. Um, so it, it all kind of ran together, but, but there was, um, you know, th- there was a week or so where, where, there, where things were, were somewhat in limbo and different conferences were handling things a little differently. And, and ultimately, everyone kind of came to the same conclusion that that, that was it and we were done. Um, but certainly a, a, t- a tough time for the coaches and, and staff, but incredibly difficult for the kids. And I guess baseball was about to get on the bus to go on a road trip, right? They were. Baseball, yeah, baseball was kind of waiting in the in – the, um, players facility to, to figure out if they were going to hop on the road to uh, wake forest and then like i said uh, track was track was already on the road they had not started competing i don't think but they were they were warming up and getting ready to go and then um basketball was obviously um on the court warming up getting ready for for the florida state game what is it like when i mean you played a major or i guess all of you did as far as the building of the softball stadium and the 
and just the fruition of of that and like you said they were putting together a season that <laughs> not many people yeah. expected for for that to just go from 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 feeling ecstatic to to then just being wiped off the table totally with a with an empty stadium yeah that that was a, a gut punch for sure um you know there was there were a lot of folks that were that were involved you know from from the start, you know, this was, this was going back two years ago before we even, you know, had a coach or anything. We we're sitting in the room talking about, was this something that we wanted to do and, and did this make sense? And, and, you know, from a competitive standpoint, we, we all felt like it was a no brainer that the, the, the Southeast is such a rich softball area and, and a hotbed for talent that, you know, it made a lot of sense competitively to do it. Um, but I think I'd, I think we'd be lying if, if we said that we thought that they would have that kind of success, you know, right off the bat, they, you know, they were, they were five and one leading the, um, the ACC in wins. Um, and, and just, you know, really playing well, I'd upset, uh, Georgia at home, knocked off a ranked team. Uh, and, and just, and just so many cool stories with the no hitter at the first, um, the first home win was, was Logan came all, who was the first one to sign and threw the no hitter and, all the walk-offs, you know, the, Valerie had the walk-off uh, at UVA to win the first ACC game. Just, I mean, just an incredible story and the way the team was coming together and coaching staff did an unbelievable job, you know, fighting through some of the injuries and, and making sure that they had players ready to go. And um, so I, I think everyone, everyone over there felt like th- this team was truly something special and, and, you know, the, the sky was kind of the limit. So, Hopefully they'll be able to, to pick up and, and come back another year stronger. But that was probably the group I, I felt the worst for just, you know, them having uh, some of those girls, you know, had already been on campus for a year without playing. And so um, kind of the build up and the anticipation and everything that, that, that had been put into that. Uh, and then for it to, to kind of get put on hold halfway through the season was, was really tough. And just moving forward, I, what I sort of can't stop thinking about in terms of the challenges of, you know, universities, Clemson and everywhere else is like, if you, if you, if before this happened, you know, you came up with a list of Dan Radakovich's top five most stressful <laughs> things, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's already a stressful job to begin with or, or, or Jim Clement's top five list of most stressful things he has to deal with. Um, that is is rendered like you know a footnote compared to the things they're trying mm-hmm. to uh solve right now what do you think and, and it's and it's hard to you know here on on may 20th it's hard to really um you know come come to any firm conclusions just simply because it seems like everybody's kind of in a wait and see holding pattern mm-hmm. uh, you know wait and see is what's going to happen over the next few weeks um What's the biggest challenge? Um, and it's almost kind of ridiculous to, to limit it to one challenge, but as you see it, as you, you leave Clemson, what, what do you think is the biggest thing, the, the hardest thing to solve um, moving forward if there is only one thing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think right now the, the biggest challenge is the unknown, the uncertainty. You know, how long is this going to last? What's the what's the impact going to be? You know, as we sit here right now, we're we're still over three months away from football season, and over you know right at three months away from classes starting back. So, um, you think back to what what three months ago look like and we're sitting there in the middle of February. And so it's, it's entirely different. So that's the hardest thing is, is just kind of figuring out what this looks like, um, moving forward. And, you know, obviously there's a huge financial piece to this, you know, whether it's an athletic department or a university as a whole. Um, you know, I was talking to someone the other day and, and they're like, well, you know, they, the, some of the big East schools have this easy because they don't have football. So they're just kind of sitting back laughing, aren't they? And I was like, no, because so much of their money comes from the university, from student yes. fees. And, um, you know, if, if enrollment's down or if they're online only, you know, that that's going to hurt their athletic department in, in the exact same way as not having football with her. You know, obviously 
different dollar amounts and different things, but they're so heavily reliant on that, just like the, the Power 5 schools are, are so heavily reliant on football. Um, so there's going to be a huge uh, financial impact. But, but then the, the, other, the other challenge is you know, the operational and, and game logistics uh, of all this. You know, we went through a big change at Clemson um, with the metal detectors, and it was um, the first year we kind of piloted it. So two seasons ago, we piloted it, tested it out, see it, saw what issues we had, um, and, and then last year when we rolled them out, ultimately it, it was a lot smoother than we expected because we were able to test it. We were able to communicate to fans, and, and they listened, and they followed the advice, and they came early. It all worked, but now we're, we're – we're faced with a whole new challenge and we don't know what this is going to look like. You know, obviously there's, there's pieces that, that um, we're looking at from a, from a planning standpoint of do you socially distance within the stadium. You, you obviously need to change from um, in the bathrooms, the fixtures, toilets and, and sinks need to become touchless. Do you change how you distribute concessions? You know, do, does, do the nachos, go away and now you're only doing prepackaged wrap things. Um, how do you handle the, um, uh, the gate attendants as they're checking tickets um, and, and the lines that form on all those things, you know, what do you do with the elevators to get up to the premium levels? You can only fit a couple of people in the elevator at a time. Does that back things up? Do you have to open the stadium earlier? There, there's so many things that um, I think people can plan for and and we can find ways around it you know there are a lot of incredibly smart and creative people that, that work in athletics whether pro college whatever that will be able to to find ways to make this work but right now we just don't know what that looks like and what what kind of guidelines and restrictions we're going to have in place then um and so that's that's really difficult and and, and the other challenge too is that it's not in our control you know it's not something that we can sit here as a conference or as a school or, and make these decisions. So much of it is dependent on federal laws and, and legislation and, and um, guidance. And then uh, some of it state by state too. So you know, what happens if South Carolina and Mississippi say that everything's good and open and you can play, but um, you know, California and New York and some of these others don't open up that much. Um, so, you know, it's kind of hard to hard to pinpoint one exact item, but I think right now the, the biggest challenge is just the uncertainty. And, um, you know, you could drive yourself crazy coming up with different models and financial things and return to play plans and guidelines, but um, we just we just don't know. So a lot of it's going to be uh, kind of making the the best decision you can at that time and then adapting as, as you get new information or as things change. When you refer to the the federal part of it, are you referring specifically to the legislation that's up for possibly uh, granting immunity to, uh, I guess, particularly higher education, uh, uh, shielding them from from lawsuits? Yeah, I mean, kind of in all in, in uh, all ways, whether it's federal um, federal government, NCAA, just in anything that is kind of. Um, you know, looming out there or, or, you know, any possibilities of things that we haven't even thought about yet that, that could come, um, you know, but it's not a, it's not a, a, an athletic department's decision or a conference's decision on how to do things. I mean, there, there is some, there's some say in it for sure, but, um, some of this is going to be things, items that are pushed down to us that we don't have a, a vote or a voice in. Uh huh. Um, and is, as far as like, Opening your stadium up to fans, is it a case of, you know, the ticket, whether it's a virtual ticket or a physical ticket, you put something on there, or maybe there's already something on there that says, you know, some sort of waiver type language that says, okay, mm-hmm. this is your decision. Um, you know, you're coming here at your own risk, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, we're, we're here at Mississippi State. We're working through it with, with general counsel to see what exactly do we need to put on there. Um, you know, there's there's some sort of assumed risk when you come to a stadium, but um, we do need to put put some language in that, that does safeguard ourselves um, from that. And obviously, the hope is that, that 
people would, if they were um, sick, they would stay home, or if they felt like they were at risk due to age or, or health conditions, that, that they wouldn't come to a game. Um, but, you know, living in the South, people are, are incredibly passionate, and, and um, you know, the, if, they, if there's a college football game on, there's not much that's going to stop them from coming. So um, we do have to do that. That is obviously um, uh, every, something that every school is thinking through and, and trying to figure out what the exact wording is. But we're um, kind of deferring to our general counsel to, to come up with the correct language. Rice is a staple in my household, and at times over the last month, we haven't been able to find any of the grocery store. Well, here's an opportunity to have an exceptionally high-quality rice, Charleston Gold Rice, delivered to your front door. Good friend Don Quattlebaum, Clemson Class of 76, produces Charleston Gold Rice at Georgetown's White House Plantation in South Carolina's old title rice fields. The property on the PD and Black Rivers dates to 1735. My family has eaten this rice, and we love it. You can absolutely taste the difference. Find Charleston Gold Rice at Geechee Board. Boymill.com. That's G E E C H I E, boymill.com. Phone number 843 631 Also ask them about their wholesale opportunities. Big supporter of the Clemson Dubcast is Harris Flooring America. Based in Anderson, South Carolina, Harris Flooring has been instrumental in a lot of the facilities transformation you've seen on Clemson's campus lately. From the Allen Reeves Center to the McFadden Building to Memorial Stadium to the Neary Center, family owned and operated since 1947. The owner Scott Junkins, big Clemson guy. Harris Flooring is just as good inside the home and the residential realm as they are with the larger scale commercial stuff. Give them a call 864-642-6183 or online at flooringamerica-anderson.com. I want to ask you this and, and underscore that I'm only asking you to guess. I'm not asking you to answer this from a position of authority because again this is it's may 20th and really nobody knows uh with any precision uh, what's going to end up happening in in uh september but if you had to guess what would be more likely for a place like clemson you know a, a, a cap of say fifteen thousand or closer to 60,000 or 50,000 any kind of any type of guess yeah. here again on May 20th man that's that's a tough one um you know, obviously the, the hope would be that that it's 60,000 um or, or 80,000 if you could but um I, I truly don't know it and you know, part of it's going to be what's the what's the public sentiment you know even if we did say we're going to open it up and you know Clemson said Every, you could have a person in every seat. Are there going to be enough people that feel comfortable coming to, to do that? Um, or you're going to have people that, that want to hold for a year and try to come back next year once they have a better idea of how things are going to look. So I don't know. I, I hope um, for a variety of reasons that we're back up close to, to full capacity. But um at this point, it kind of it, it almost changes by the by the minute. There are times when when um, when things happen where you're, you're like, okay, this is this is trending really good, and and you know we think that, that things are going to look better than than we think, and then um, and then something will happen, or some school will come out and say something, and then you start to worry that oh man, did we just take another step backwards? And so um, I think at, at this point, a lot of the schools are planning for what that reduced number looks like the you know 15 to, to 25 percent capacity um because it's it's probably better to plan that way and not need it than it is to to not have any idea and then wait you know a month before the season and have to scramble and figure out what that looks like um but that's a that's a great question and and if i had any idea i, I think um it, it'd be a, a pure guess at this point yeah, the, the daily emotional roller coaster it has been amazing because everybody I talk to at, at every level is, is living this same, like, one event makes you feel pessimistic, and then the next day, another development, you, 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 you know, you're like, oh, cool, we can get through this. It's just, it seems like everybody's yeah. going through the same thing. Yeah, and it's not just sports, too. Right, right. You know, there's... Um, and that's the thing I remember talking with, with Owen Godfrey, the or, uh, assistant AD for tickets. Uh, I was actually standing in, in the, um, um, 
Oh, indoor facility at, at Pro Day, and and he called and said some people were asking about uh, questions on refunds for football tickets in the fall, and I just sat there thinking, man, if we're still dealing with this come the fall, you know, this is six, seven, eight months later, what is that going to look like for the economy? What's that going to look like mentally for for people's health? I mean, that's a long time to to really be going through this, and so. Um, yeah, you know, that was that was in early March, and now here we are, three months or two months later. It's and, only been two months, Eric. It feels like yeah. a year. It's crazy. I know it. I know it. And for those for those that have kids, I think it's probably felt like even longer. Than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the, the the amount of respect that that people are going to have for teachers and coaches now is is just incredible. It's you know, it, it's no longer um, hey, you know, my kid's a great kid and and you're just not teaching them right it's it people start to understand you know what 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 these uh, professions go through every day and and have a, an immense amount of respect for that um but yeah it, it's not just athletics it's across the board you know there's there are things that that give you a lot of hope and then there are other things that that really make you worry about what what could ha- what could come um so you know i, I don't know i, I think um you have to have that optimism that, that things are going to going to get better and return to to a more normal situation. Um, but at this point, I think it's a lot of just waiting and seeing. And yeah, you mentioned the topic of sort of a natural thinning of of a of a home of a game day crowd in terms of. I mean, it's, I think it's logical to assume that older, a substantial number of older folks um would would not come and then a substantial number of people who just aren't ready in general Mm -hmm. to to Mm -hmm. to be a part of crowd so is that something that's fairly prominent in in the discussions as well uh i guess to your knowledge yeah you know part of the as we're running through these models of what does a stadium look like with with 15 to 20 percent capacity 25 percent capacity um you know we're, we're the first cut or kind of the the natural ones were, you know, the last thing we want to do is sit here and, and tell people, Hey, thanks. We, we, we know you really want to come to the game, but you can't. So, you know, looking at, at visiting ticket blocks, I would be shocked if, if many teams brought visiting fans and, and in the ACC, a lot of them already don't, you know, some of the schools, Clemson plays, the fans don't travel well. Um, but I think they're going to travel even less now um so visiting blocks will free it up i i would be very surprised if schools brought bands and even for home games it, you know do you have a band because that's something where you're in very close contact and you're blowing in, into the instruments and and you know spreading a lot of germs so um how do the bands look if, if you do away with those that completely changes the atmosphere and that you know that's part of what what makes college football what it is, is, is kind of that, that pageantry, um, that you don't have in the NFL. So, uh, there, there are certain groups even within the stadium that you look at and, you know, premium areas. If you're in a suite and you've got 12 tickets in the suite and you know, everybody, their family, and you've been around them, you probably don't need to, to, you know, decrease the size of that. Um, but then when you're in the lower and upper bowl, you probably do. And clubs, maybe you need to decrease it, but not as much. Um, so there's a lot of discussions about how can we kind of naturally drop those numbers. And then the other part too is, um, you know, if you have to spread people out and, and you, you know, Larry say you've always had lower bowl tickets and you've been in the, on the 40 yard line for the last 15 years. And now because things are getting spread out, you're moving to, the top corner of the lower deck or you're moving to the upper deck, you may say that's not worth it to me. Um, so, so there's a lot of discussion on how can we kind of naturally thin this out and spread people out a little bit. Um, and I think kind of the, the prevailing thought from a lot of schools is that you give a one year, um, kind of basically exception so that you don't lose your seat in line. You know, a lot of, a lot of the places, if you don't make a, a payment, you don't renew your tickets, you, you go to the back of the line. Well, if you if you do a one-year exception, does that help people feel good about not coming if, if they if they have concerns or health issues? 
they don't come, but they don't lose their money. They don't lose their place in line. Um, and so does that, does that further help kind of naturally pare down what, what um, capacity looks like? But with all this though, every time you, you take a person out of the stadium, that's ticket revenue, that's um, seat equity, that's concessions. That's, you know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of revenue streams that are hit by fans coming to the games and, and would be negatively impacted if capacity is reduced. In a normal year, uh, seven home games for Clemson are worth what? Something about forty million total? Would you estimate? Uh, no, I'd, I'd say it, 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 excluding TV and all that, it's um, it's probably going to be up closer to, to sixty million. Wow! Between between the annual fund um, donations to Ipte, the seed equity donations to Ipte, um, you know, parking, all that that that's, that's done through through the Ipte side, and then the, the ticket revenue to the um to the athletic department it's it's probably um it's probably closer to 60 million or so yeah that's the part that you know might be sort of ca- you can't casually forget as uh, you know on the topic of okay we got to play these games to get the tv money well <laughs> there's a there's a lot of other money uh that's sitting there too that if yep, you don't certainly. have it it leads to some pretty catastrophic repercussions <laughs> Um, for sure, and certainly with the with the ACC not being as high on on the distribution standpoint, you know, you, you're talking high twenty millions compared to the SEC and and the Big Twelve or the Big Ten, who were you know forty five to to fifty five million. Um, there's a, a lot bigger reliance on the the ticket sales and the um, donations side to to close that gap. Okay, with all, you know, there's obviously the topic, the very real topic of, of the economic angle, you know, where there's all this, all these efforts, extreme measures that are theoretically going to be devoted to, you know, having the right distancing and all these precautions, uh, not just, you know, at a, at a football stadium, but on campus, uh, when student, if and when students come back, you know we've talked about the band. You know, boy, you know we can't have them, you know, being you know really close together. We we can't cover all that without covering like the the elephant in the room of you've had all this distancing that takes place, all these extreme measures, and then everybody sits down, socially distant, ideally, to watch twenty two football players. Rolling around on a <laughs> rolling around on a on a football field like that's the question I am trying to sort of reconcile sort of the ethical moral whatever is that fair? Yeah, that's that's another great question, um, and I think you know schools are doing everything they can. They're exploring every every um, possible plan and, and situation to to make sure that that these student athletes are safe. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think that we would get to the point where, where you quarantine them in a dorm and you only, you have a, a, an athlete only dorm and you don't let them out of it to, to do anything other than go to practice and stuff. Uh, you know, there, there's part, part of that is, is the, the reality that these are, these are college kids and they're going to want to hang out with their friends and they're going to want to be around other people. Um, so, you know, we were talking um, about, all the different things you can do in the facilities to keep things separated. And the NCAA has released some guidance on, you know, it even goes as far as to say, don't use the same ball. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if you're um, receiver and quarterback playing catch, you know, how does that work? So they're talking about, there's all this guidance and all these things you can do about separating them and, um, you know, cleaning the facilities and all that. But there's nothing to stop them in, you know, two minutes after they leave the facility from, hopping in the car with a buddy and going to someone else's house and, you know, five or six of them getting together or going to a party that night or something. So, um, there's the, the, um, you know, kind of realization that, that you can't prevent people from, from associating with other people and being around other people. So how do we take every precaution that we can to ensure that, while they are here and while they are under our supervision, they are in the safest possible situation. 
Um, but, but going back to your question specifically about, you know, the actual competition and playing, that, that's a, that's a very real concern. And, um, I don't know that anyone has a great answer on, on what that looks like. You know, if someone does come, come down with it and they do test positive and, you know, if they're a, for a kid that's playing football on Saturday and they test positive on Monday, well, there was nothing you could do to prevent them from playing because you didn't know about it at the time, but how many people did they come in contact with? Um, and it's a, it's a very real concern and fear, but hey, uh, at this point, I don't know that anyone has a, a perfect answer for it. Yeah. And, and, the, and one of the, on that topic, one of the great positives to date is that uh, there are not, there, there are hardly any cases of, 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 of student athletes in that demographic anywhere. Um, yeah. I, I mean, there was a Florida State offensive lineman um, right early mm-hmm. on. He, he, Baselli, yeah, yeah Baselli, he, His whole family got sick. His dad, um, his dad had to go to ICU. I think for for three days. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, there are probably some other cases here and there. But you would think that if there were a, a, a good number of them, a lot of these athletes would have gone ahead and and announced it on their own social media channels. Probably I would, I mean, that's what I would imagine. Um, I guess the, yeah, I guess the danger, the day, the, the, the more present danger that in my mind, at least would be the, the coaches and support staffers, the, the army of people around the team, uh, that are, you know, Robbie Caldwell, uh, 68 years old, I think. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. had a, had a, a, pretty advanced medical procedure i think around a year ago you know woody mccorvey cancer survivor and i mean that's with every team you know mac brown is is 68 mm-hmm. i believe um mm-hmm. so those uh you know those questions are the ones that are uh i guess the the, the or, or like a parent of a player you know um getting getting infected yeah. or whatever the the sort of secondary uh, uh effects or, or dangers of it yeah, and, and 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 those are you know those are our questions and concerns, you know, in general outside of athletics as well. You you've got professors that are, um, a lot of professors are, are older than than the you know, um, was it sixty or so like the, the kind of the, the the safe age, um, or or may have issues, and yeah, even go out to business owners and all that. So. Um, you know, I don't think we're, we're unique in a sense of having people that might, might be more susceptible and, and making sure that we have avenues for them to, to stay safe. Um, I think, you know, obviously the difference is that we're, we're bringing in 40, 50, 60, 70, 80,000 people into a spot at one time. Um, but if you look across the board, there, there are a lot of, a lot of professions and industries where, where you do have people um, at, at a high ri- higher risk age that you, you have to plan accordingly and, and provide some, some avenues for them to still be able to do their job, but, but maybe do it um, at, a, at a greater distance or with some safeguards in place. You mentioned some of the cases of like Big East schools and others who are in a not a good situation at all, mainly because of their reliance on student fees, tuition hikes to support athletics. We saw Furman cut their baseball program. I would think this is only the beginning, you know, because I guess the difference between this, you know, power five type schools and the ones who the football play in schools who are sort of a lower level aspiring to, to be big time, so to speak, is that they depend on tuition hikes, controversial tuition hikes, really. Um, and, 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 substantial student fees to support their athletic programs whereas Clemson is is more reliant of course on TV revenues and and direct donor support do you think this puts Clemson and Mississippi State and and other major schools in a better much better position to withstand hopefully uh, a, a brief relatively brief um, uh recession i don't know if that's the word uh, uh the the blow um from something like this yeah I, there's a 
I, I think so. Um, th- there's still a lot of uncertainty with all of this and what does it look like, but um, yeah, it, at least on the, on the power five side, it, it is pretty self-contained within athletics and being able to, um, to hold games and have TV revenue and have fans support it. Um, it. It's tough for the smaller schools, you know, some of the HBCUs and some of the group of five schools that, that are heavily reliant on students. And, you know, that's out, that's outside of, of athletics control. And, um, you know, they don't know what exactly that's going to, that's going to look like. And it may take longer for enrollment numbers to, to pick back up. Uh, than it would for you know fans to start coming to games. So I, I, my gut feeling is yes, it's probably going to hit them harder and and maybe last longer. Uh, but it's 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 a little bit uh, of a to be determined outlook too. Uh, I guess previous uh, you know before the pandemic, uh, one of the major issues. Uh, facing, I guess, the ACC was the dramatically increasing TV revenues that you, you alluded to earlier uh, within the SEC and the, and the Big Ten and, and the ACC trying to keep up. The The one thing that sticks out to me um, was the uh, SEC, the game of the week, the CBS game of the week. I want to say... Mm-hmm. I forgot the figure on that, but I think it was like fifty million a year. CBS was paying. I could be wrong on that, but anyway, the it was speculated mm-hmm. that ESPN was prepared to pay three hundred and fifty million um, for that package. That just the the game of the week package. And correct me if I'm yeah. wrong on on any of this, but that's kind of scary if you're sitting there uh, in in the ACC. What's your sort of What's your take on that and, and, and sort of the existential sort of questions just strictly related to the, to the revenue part of it with the ACC? Yeah. You know, put my, put my Clemson hat back on. That, that, that's a huge concern. You know, when you look at the peers of Clemson, especially on a, from a football, you know, competitive standpoint, you're, you're looking at Alabama, you're looking at Georgia, um, you're looking at Ohio State, which I know they're they're not SEC, but the Big Ten numbers up there as well. Um, you know, looking across down the road, two hours in Columbia, hey, when when your peers are getting, you know, fifteen to, to thirty million more than you, you just can't make that up. You know, you can try as hard as you want, but um, that's where it becomes incredibly important for Clemson and for the ACC schools to be very responsible with how they spend their money and, and to make sure that, that that dollar goes as far as it can possibly go. And you're not buying um, a bunch of stuff that's not going to add value in some form or fashion, you know, whether that's money spent on recruiting or um, travel or, or equipment that's going to help with performance. You, you've got to be very, very diligent in, in, in what you spend and, and how you spend it on. Um, now there's certainly some things that, that the schools can do and, and the ACC network is going to continue to grow and pick up. And I think in a lot of ways, some of this um, pandemic stuff will help the TV market. You know, if, if more fans are staying home, hopefully more will subscribe to the ACC network and help in that way. Um, but th- there are some things that, that schools can do and, and some, some different revenue generating strategies and, and things, but, uh, and to a large extent, it, it's really going to be, you know, making sure you can squeeze every last drop out of the, the resources you have um, because there's just, you know, a finite um, amount of money that, that that's coming in um, right now. And, and you know, the, I've heard a lot of people talk too about using this, this pandemic as a, as a reset button. And, and so, um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what schools do change how they, you know, how they travel, how they recruit all that um, based on, on everything that, that's happening right now. And then what does that look like post pandemic um, you know, salaries are probably one area that, that 
the ACC is always going to really, really struggle to compete with. Um, but that whole market could look different coming up here, you know, in the near future. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a, um, it's a great question. It's something that, that the ACC schools have talked a lot about and just trying to find different things to, to be more efficient in operations and, and more creative in revenue generation. But it's a, it's a large graph that it will only get bigger when, um, when the ESPN deal comes through. Can this be boiled down to two things? One of them, the SEC has hundreds of thousands of, of fans who think about football 365 days a year. The ACC only has a few schools who have that demographic. And then number two, um, the ACC needs somebody other than Clemson to emerge, uh, preferably multiple teams, to emerge in that top 10, top 15 level. Is it Does it boil down to those two things yeah. primarily? I think that's a lot of it. Yeah, I think um, you know the, the one one of the the cool things. In a lot of ways, uh, you know, the ACC is a very diverse conference. You've got some great basketball. You've you've got Clemson and and you know the history of Florida State. They're not they're not there right now, but um, you've got that. Baseball has won uh, a couple. Um, you know, UVA won a, a few years ago. There, there are a lot of schools that are, that are very good um, in the ACC of kind of across the board. Um, and obviously you've got the academic prestige and all that. Um, but yeah, ultimately when, when you're talking about these big TV deals, football is what drives it. And it's just um, it, it, over the last couple of years, that's it, not been something where the ACC has been incredibly strong. And, and I think it's going to take a, 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 a um, you know, a true effort by these schools to invest in football and to make sure that football is is really at the forefront. Um, and that's you know, that's gonna that's gonna kind of take changing a culture in, in some places, and um, may take some time to get there. You know, this isn't the first time that there were sort of doomsday project figurative i hate to say that in today's <laughs> given today's mm-hmm. overall world but you know back in the, during the realignment uh years uh 2010 11 12 i guess you know back then if you said clemson was gonna be do was gonna emerge as a national championship a perennial national championship contender people would have said you're crazy. It was thought that they were fundamentally incapable of doing that because of primarily because of the financial disparity between the ACC and the SEC back then. I mean, you know, there was a fear in, in 2000 as of as recently as 2011 and 12 that South Carolina was just ready to lap Clemson in in part because of that financial advantage that existed then. What would you say to a Clemson fan who says you know, I don't care about the rest of the ACC. You know, we've got the right coach, and and we're gonna we're gonna win no matter what. We're gonna be fine. What do you say to that point of mm-hmm. view? Yeah, there, there's there's certainly a, a portion of it that is you know kind of worry about yourself and and let the rest take care of itself. Um, and you know, Dan Dan had a, a, a real good quote, and he, he's always talked about. Um, it's about the people, you know, you, you, um, resources are important. Like you need to have money. You need to be able to do that stuff, but, but you got to have the right people calling the shots and pulling the trigger to, to make it all work. Um, and I don't think anyone, you know, to your point, I don't think anyone could have ever imagined that, um, football would have taken off like it is, but you get the right people here and you keep them here. Um, so there, there is a lot of that, thought of just you know keep keep your stuff under control manage what you can control and, and the rest will be fine but it is important from an, an overall conference perspective you need to have that that competition and i think even back the last couple of years where um clemson's been knocked for not competing against somebody you know you blow everybody out in the conference and everyone's like well you know clemson's not that good they just don't play anybody um, and so 
one one slip up may cost you a chance at the national championship. Um, yeah, I, I think back to that Syracuse game when when um, you know Kelly decided he was he was leaving and Trevor gets hurt, and so now it's up to Chase Bryce on on fourth and six to to kind of carry the team. If you lose that game, you're 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 probably out of the the national championship conversation and with, with very little chance to get back into it. Um, you know, Bama or Georgia loses a game and they're still right there in the mix. And so I think, I think it is important, um, for the conference to have some of that, that overall strength just from a a reputation and, um, you know, will will help maybe give you a little more margin for error. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you're right. If you, if you control the things that you can control and you win the games you're supposed to win, you know, Clemson will be in that spot. Um, so there's, uh, you know, you can you can certainly see both sides of the argument, um, but Clemson's been between um, Terry Don Phillips and, and Dan has has hired some great people and put them in a in a position to succeed and, and allowed them to to be creative and to try to find new ways. Um, so I, I feel like even if the, the ACC doesn't doesn't pick up, Clemson's going to be okay. They, they're going to always. Um, they're going to be around. They're going to be strong. But but I do think it would be helpful um, financially as, as well as as um, you know reputation wise and, and strength of schedule um, perspective if if a few of the schools can can pick it up some. If you're in the Eastern Midlands and PD area and you're in any way interested in buying and selling a home, commercial property, land, need to consider reaching out to Uptown Realty. They're based out of Sumter and run by a friend of mine, Patrick Enzer, big Clemson guy, used to cover the Tigers in a newspaper capacity, longtime supporter of Tiger Illustrated, longtime listener to the Dubcast. The home buying process should be an enjoyable experience, so let Patrick and his staff do all the heavy lifting. All you got to do is pick up the phone and call 803 774 0435 or go to Uptown Realty SC. Dot com. Happy to have Founders Federal Credit Union on board as a sponsor with us. If you've been to a sporting event in Clemson, you've probably heard about Founders already. They are the official credit union partner of the Clemson Tigers. In addition to that, all Clemson faculty, staff, and students are eligible for membership as well as IPTA members. Matt Gross is a proud Clemson alum and the vice president for the Clemson market for Founders Federal Credit Union. Matt's office is located beside the Walmart neighborhood market on Old Greenville Highway in Clemson. For more information, go to Founders F- FCU.com. If you're a business owner and your business involves credit card processing, you need to reach out to Tandem Innovative Payment Solutions. A lot of different ways that Tandem can improve your bottom line by shaving off some of those expenses. In addition to processing credit card payments, Tandem also manages inventory, schedules staff, tracks sales, gains insight into customers, and gets transaction reports. With Tandem, you're not a number, you're a neighbor. Learn more about Tandem at TandemPayment.com. You think buyout protocol is going to be dramatically changed sort of in the post-pandemic economic world of athletic departments? I mean, when you were at Texas yeah. in a previous job, I mean, just making the transition from Mac Brown to Charlie Strong cost you guys, just the, just in buyouts, cost you guys an arm yeah. and a leg. And I mean, that, that yeah. obviously is taking place every, at a lot of places. Yeah, I, I, I certainly, um, I, I think it will change. Um, it, it's got to, and you, to, the, the one I always look at is A&M with, with Jimbo at a $75 million contract fully guaranteed. Um, I just, I don't think schools are going to be able to do that anymore. And even if the athletic department tries it, um, I think there's going to be even more um, oversight or pushback or, um, flat out refusal from from the board or from the um, uh, chancellor or whoever the president you know whoever whoever kind of oversees the university there's going to be more scrutiny into that um, you know, I think one thing with um, you know with, with all this is that it's it's market driven so it, it can't be just one or two schools that, that do it it's going to have to be an overall shift but I do, I do foresee that probably being uh, an outcome of the pandemic. What you, you were here for four and a half years, right? Mm-hmm. What was your right. favorite memory? Not necessarily a result, but more like a window you had into sort of 
behind the scenes of that result, if that makes any sense, if, if there is one? Man, that, that's a great question. There, there's so many, um, so many great things. I, I think probably the the most memorable thing to me was, um, and this this is tough. There, there, there are a lot, but the the first CFP run, even though we didn't win it, just the um, partly just the, the the pure joy of you know, holy cow, we we made it. And we got to the championship game and, you know, first time in 35 years. And this is incredible. Um, but also the uh, kind of behind the scenes, hair on fire, you know, part of it where none of us had, had ever planned for two bowl games at the same time. None of us really knew what we were doing. We were all just flying by the seat of our pants and, and everyone was helping out wherever they could. And, um, you know, over the – over the five seasons, we got into a really good rhythm, and we had it. I mean, we probably were, as, were as, as good and efficient at it as anyone in the country. But I mean, that first year was just, um, you know, it was crazy. A lot of late nights and you know, spending Christmas break planning for the, the trip out to um, uh, down to Miami and then out to, to Phoenix. Um, but that was that was a really cool thing that, that not many people get the uh, opportunity to experience. Um, and, and just the, you know, the, 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 like I said, the joy and being in the, um, the hotel after we won the orange bowl and just seeing how genuinely excited everyone was, you know, it was, um, that was really cool, but a lot of great experiences. Um, one of the things I, I really enjoyed, um, this, this kind of, this may surprise you, but, um, you know, for the, for the baseball regionals. Uh, the, the team can't pull the tarp. Normally the, the players go out there and they pull the tarp and help the grounds crew and stuff. Um, but the teams can't do that. So we always would volunteer to, to go help, you know, some of the, some of the department staff would go pull the tarp. And uh, that was just such a, 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 a kind of cool time. You know, you're, um, you're sitting there waiting at 10 o'clock at night. Cause the, there's a storm coming in and you're going to have to run out there and pull the tarp and you're just hanging out with everyone you know, down in the, the grounds crew area. Um, I brought my daughter out there one, one night we were pulling it on like a Saturday night and she came out and watched. And so, um, there's just so many cool, cool experiences that the, the family atmosphere of Clemson, um, makes it, makes it even more special than, than a lot of places. It's so interesting. You make the point about that first time, uh, winning that orange bowl, because in the semifinals after that, the ones that Clemson won, it was more like, okay, you know, the feeling was uh, from the Clemson side was, okay, took care of business, proved these people wrong. But that mm-hmm. first time, I'll never forget, you know, myself uh, hanging out outside the locker room as, as, they, as you all came in off the field, and you could feel it. It was like not just players, not just coaches – uh, but also families of the support staff, people you know, the trustees and their families. It was just unbridled joy, like you, you couldn't believe. Yeah. It was a, it's a magical feeling that you you can only have that first time. Exactly, exactly. And I'd say even you know winning the national championship was incredible. Um, and, and I can't even imagine what it have been had we won the, the first go around in, in Phoenix. Um, but even after we won, there, there was still kind of that expectation that, that next year that, that we would be there and we would be competing and we would win. Um, that first year was just, it was, it was so fun. And, and just like you said, just the, the pure joy. Okay. You have two young children, your wife, I believe ha- had a workout studio here in Clemson. So mm-hmm. you, you guys were firmly rooted in the community, in a great community, how hard was it yeah. to, 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 to uproot Man, at that point? I, I don't even think I can, can express how hard it was. Um, I mean, on paper, this was an incredible move. Uh, it was a great opportunity, great chance, you know, career wise for, for growth and, and development. And it was seven hours closer to home. And my mom actually went to Mississippi state and grew up in, um, Mississippi. So there, there were so many things on paper that, that just made this a no brainer. And, and I wrestled with it for, for two straight days going back and forth. Um, 
And it was really because of, of how much we loved it there, how great the people were, the community. Um, you know, I, it was, uh, I went to Clemson not really knowing a whole lot about it. And, and when, when Graham brought me out for the interview, um, Laura, my wife, came with me. And, and uh, we immediately had that feeling when we were there, like, this is home. Um, and so it was, it was incredibly tough. Um, and yeah, I still don't know that it's fully sunk in yet that, that we're, that we're gone, but, um, I, I can't think of a, of a more special place with, with better people. Um, and, and I, I truly hope at some point, whether it's a, it's a retirement home or what, but I, I hope at some point we're back there because it's, um, it, it's a spot that will, will always hold a, hold a special place in our hearts. We've gone an hour, and I haven't even mentioned Mike Leach. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Have you yep. sat down with him? I have not. He actually um, he took off. Uh, all the coaches kind of scattered. A lot of them went back to Washington to, to be with their families and stuff um, once all this hit. Uh, so he's, he's down in Florida right now, and, and I've, um, I've been on Zoom calls but, but have not actually met him face-to-face yet. Yeah, I guess that's a stupid question, given that that most coaches aren't aren't even aren't even on campus yet. But that should be a lot of fun. I'm sure you've thought about the rare sort of uh, experience you have of going from from Dabo Sweeney to Mike Leach, two of the two of the treasures of college football history, for for different reasons. That's right. Well, and you know, it's something I think is is really cool with, with both of those guys is just um, they they do it their way and and they are incredibly um, confident in who they are and they're not going to change because, you know, uh, a sports writer or a media member or a fan or somebody calls them out. Like they are, they are true to themselves. And um, I, I think in, it, th- that's a pretty unique quality, it, not just in athletics, but, but for somebody to, to, to be so confident and secure in, in who they are as a person that, that they're not, um, they're not ashamed to come out and say something. Um, you know, that's, that's a, a pretty cool quality. And, um, so I think that there are, there are definitely some similarities between the two and, and obviously both of them, um, knocked out of the park in press conferences and both have been incredibly successful coaches. Um, so it, it's going to be fun. It, it's certainly going to be different. Um, and I've, uh, uh, I, I probably will have some, some great stories here to come, but, um, you know, looking forward to learn, learned a lot working with the football staff at Clemson and, and just how they did things and um, excited to, to be around a, a new staff and see how they do things and, and you know, figure out what, what things I can take away from that as well. So you're closing on your house in Clemson today. We are. We are. We, we, uh, we signed the paperwork yesterday and, and overnighted it back to them. So fingers crossed everything goes through. So doing all that virtually, I guess. Yeah, that's right. Well, Eric George, man, what a great conversation in so many ways. I really appreciate you sharing your time during a extremely busy time. Best of luck uh, to you and your in your new endeavor, and and hopefully you and your family will, will love it in Starkville as much as you did over here over here in Clemson. Hey, thanks, Larry. I, I appreciate you having me on. Um, I will. Uh, I'll always be following Clemson um, and and pulling for everyone there, and, and hopefully. Um, our, our paths, but but even just just my path to it and with Clemson will cross again at some point, and um, and, and can't wait to get back there and, and see everybody and um, kind of have a, a, an official uh, goodbye since since everything's been been kind of limited and virtual right now. No doubt. Thank you so much, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Take care. All right. Thanks to Eric George for joining us. Really good stuff. You know, hard for anybody to pin down. Uh, what is going to happen or what might happen months from now. But I thought Eric did a really good job of covering sort of what athletics department folks at Clemson, Mississippi State, and plenty of other places are sort of thinking right now. Thanks to our sponsors for their support. Please keep them and other businesses in mind during this difficult time. Patronize them as much as you can. And thanks to you all for listening and making this a part of your routine. Everybody have a great rest of the week, and we will be back next week. Cheers. Thank you.